joining us also acknowledge their own homelands and sacrifices, as well as the cultural and artistic gifts indigenous peoples have granted each of us. This is a segue into our panel presentation this afternoon as we look forward to an insightful discussion on Voices of the Clay, San Ildefonso Pottery, 1600 to 1930. The traditional name of the village, Pojogeowinge, is a place where the water cuts through. I also welcome community members from San Ildefonso Pueblo and many other guests and visitors who are joining us this afternoon. I'll let the panel talk to the project, but it's important to know that here at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, we envision these conversations and exhibits as a series of community engagement. I look forward to the many continued collaborations and working with our panelists and others who have a vested interest in discussing access for museum engagement. I'd like to introduce uh, Lilia McEnany, who is a curatorial assistant at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, who has been and is instrumental in organizing today's panel. So thank you, Lilia, for your time, and I'll, I'll let you take over. So um, thank you. Kundawa. Okay, hi everybody, um, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, but before we get going to, and to echo Matthew's introduction, I'd like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are in a virtual space um, in Ogopoge within the Tewa world. As a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people, and I wish to acknowledge all of the native folks past, present, and future who walk on these lands. We have a fabulous lineup of panelists here with us today. Um, first off, oh, let me change the view so you can see everybody as I'm introducing them. Okay, um, so we have a fabulous uh, lineup of panelists here with us today. First off is Eric Fender, one of the exhibition's co-curators. Eric is an active Sandal Defonso community member and award-winning potter. He stands within his family's long lineage and heritage of producing pottery. Dr. Joseph Woody Aguilar is also an active community member at SANI, where he is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. Dr. Aguilar recently received his PhD in archaeology from the University of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Bruce Bernstein, another one of the exhibition's co-curators, is a former director of MIAC and currently serves as Chief Curator and Director of Innovation at the Ralph T. Coe Center for the Arts and as Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Pueblo of Pulaki. Um, unfortunately, the exhibition's final co-creator, Russell Sanchez, is unable to join us here today, but we received some great points from him via email that I'm sure will come up later in the conversation. And as Matthew said, my name is Lily McEnany, and I'm a curatorial assistant at the museum. So to get us started, um, I'd like to kind of lay out the trajectory of our conversation. Um, and as we were all planning this presentation, there were three major threads that really came to the surface for us. Um, the first is the story of the Museum of New Mexico's unsystematic and extractive collecting processes at San Ildefonso Pueblo. The second are, of course, discussions around pottery making, um, especially in regard to the diversity of the artistic traditions in the community, and kind of thinking through this larger idea of moving the narrative beyond black-on-black -black pottery at San I. And finally, um, the importance of the community of community-based museum practice in this exhibition in particular. So that's kind of the thread that we're gonna be following today, but to start things off, the panelists wanted to screen the exhibition's introductory film, which is about five minutes long. So that's how we're gonna start off. Um, and then we'll be back to get the conversation going. All right, it's being made in San Alfonso and also likewise in some other tribe. You know, to see, I, I was surprised to see my grandmas and then probably some other pottery that, that we know at the Pueblo. I mean, this is their, their work and they're gone. People are creative and they're interpreting their environment. They did it because they enjoyed it and they were inspired by what they saw. And as artists, they're allowed to interpret their vision in their own, own way. People think that potters are, are very constricted you know, there's a lot of rules that potters have to follow. But who set those rules? Not the potters and not the Pueblo people. Okay. People from the outside will set those rules. Yeah. Archaeologists, 
gallery uh -huh. owners, collectors. Uh -huh. How does this exhibit work to break that pattern? Well, it shows, on exhibit and so it shows the creativity and the, the mindset they had, and it shows that they were not of limited abilities. And I mean, without this, this wouldn't exist. I think people have to see us for who we are mm -hmm. and that we can live in this day and age in contemporary non-native world and still hold on to our traditions. And it's a little somewhat emotional because growing up at the Pueblo, I never seen these these pots, but I knew of my family making them. This is nice that they have them preserved so people, you know, future generations to see what our people were known for. I'm just in shock right now. It's uh, amazing to see all these pots here and to know that um, I had never seen my grandfather's work as a painter. So for me, it's very uh, emotional. This is the first time I've seen any of his work. But I remember my aunt would say that she would hear this in her voice as she was making pottery, that she would hear her mother and say, you're doing this first and foremost for you. And then you're giving it out there. These pieces here, so many that have never been seen before. It goes to the heart and it, it, it hits the heart because we know that these are our relatives. They're not just pots, they're, they're living entities, they're, they're people. And we talk to them. Like when I'm making building, I talk to them, you know, and, and it makes you feel good to talk and where you're building and it seems though it goes better, you know. You can you do better. I think it's beautiful. I'm not a potter, but just to see the hard work that she did to put into this pot, it's awesome. It's almost like you make a connection to her instantly because it feels like she's here. I mean, we always give blessings be, uh, before we begin the firing and ask our, the spirits of the flame, the wind, uh, yourself, and the people helping you that the spirit be united as one so that the firing can be successful. The village here has a very long line of pottery making, uh, also other different artisans that they would do different work, painting, jewelry, or whatever, yeah. But the history of pottery is very, very long here and very well respected. We all prayed so that the pots will come out well. We prayed to Mother Earth because we got the clay from Mother Earth. I went through my pottery making years with prayers and just keep kept going, kept going. And then I had the, the polishing stones that I had. There are different shapes for different parts, I guess, the big ones, the small ones. But my father-in-law was the one that did the thing. And like I said, he used to get yaka, and he used to cut them, then chew them and chew them till they got to a teeth where it was like a brush. And he painted all those designs on there. Well, back then, these majority of these pieces were all for to be used. These were part of everyday life. And that's what I tell people. We're brought into the world with pottery and we go, when we leave this earth, when we pass on, we go with pottery. Pottery is part of our life. You know, it's who we are as San Alfonso people. Okay, so that was a lot to think with. Um, and to start off, I'd really like to go into this idea of history. There is an overarching idea in, a, in Pueblo communities that history is recorded in pottery. Can you talk about this to kind of start us off? What histories are you trying to make visible in the exhibition? What are the connections between Samuel Defonso's histories and Mayak's institutional past? Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for being with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, we really appreciate all of you who have been able to go to the museum and see the exhibition. Uh, it's been an important marker in terms of um, presenting a, a different view of pottery 
And let me just frame what change, what that history might look like to outsiders. I'm not a sound responsible person, clearly. But that change looks like each time there's a great societal change uh, for the community of San Alfonso, pottery changes. This happens when people have the end of their great migration. There's a certain style of pottery that's called biscuit wares. When the Spanish arrive, there's another new style of pottery. As people settle in a little bit with the Pueblo Revolt, uh, there's another style of pottery. In the middle part of the 18th century, yet another style as people settle in further. Uh, with colonizers living in close proximity. And finally, the end of the 19th, early 20th century with the cash economy, there's again, great changes in pottery that start. We always assume that these changes come from the outside world, that there's a famous story of Edgar Hewitt, the first director of the museum and school. And he handed a, a potter from the village, assured and said, can you make this for me? I don't think it quite worked like that, the changes come from within the community, and that was one of the most important things we wanted to tell people through the exhibition, uh, that changes, changes keep the community strong. Those changes are incredibly important to pottery, and um, that's why it reflects who people are. I don't know if, Eric, or what do you want to expand on that? No. <laughs> Eric, do you want to add to that? No. Oh, okay. Um, so I think that point is really important that change is coming from within the community and that leads into the conversation about this larger narrative and this larger idea that people have about what San Aldebonzo pottery is and looks like. So I'm sure a lot of the viewers who are watching now automatically go to thinking about a particular artist and the, that type of work that that particular artist made. Um, well, I guess before I say anything, I just want to take like a moment to recognize Laura Escalante, who you saw in that video. Um, we recently lost her. Uh, she, she passed this past week and she was, um, she was instrumental in the the content of the exhibit um, and you can see more of her videos um, on, on YouTube or were you able to go into the museum you could see her uh, in the context of the exhibit um, but just wanted to do a, a little acknowledgement of, of her her contribution her legacy um, if you're able to take a, take take a look at some of the other videos um, we just lost a, a treasure really um, who who contributed to not only my own thinking of the pottery and the collections in the museum, but the exhibit itself. And I think the Pueblo's way of thinking about museums and their collections. So um, just a little acknowledgement of her, her life legacy and contribution. Eric, do you want to talk a little bit about Sanai and pottery? Yeah. Um, so the history of the Pueblo is, you know, like uh, Bruce mentioned, there's these different stages of uh, pottery styles and development within the community, but it goes further than that too. It's also, you know, when you look at pottery, you can um, kind of see a correlation between, um, I guess you'd say good years and bad years. Um, maybe when there was drought you know you don't see that much a diverse uh, work being done the design work is a lot simpler um, but when there's a good year when the good harvest and you know the things are going good within the community then you you notice that some of the pots were uh, maybe more elaborately painted and decorated uh, more production of pottery. Um, so there's all these different factors, but, um, you know, so it's a, it's a indicator, I guess you'd say, of um, the way the years were. And, um, but this ties into the history, you know, probably when we were in the, when the Pueblo was in the midst of the Spanish flu in 1918, um, you know, 
a lot of our, we lost a lot of people within the community and going from one of the largest Pueblos down to now one of the smallest Pueblos. And um, during that time, you know, there was just a handful of potters making pottery. But yet at the same time, the diversity of those pieces that were being created, you know, it shows a lot that um, people were still part, it was still part of who, who they were and who we are. So, you know, with that, I, you know, like to add to what Woody said, you know, we lost um, Miss Laura Escalante mm -hmm. and she was, um, when she came to help out with the exhibit, you know, a lot of, a lot of the pottery that she saw was, um, for the first time seeing her grandmother's work and being able to actually hold her grandmother's work. So, you know, she was really um, touched and moved and she contributed a lot to this project. So like Woody said, you know, I wanna take a moment and say thank you to her and her legacy and what she's leaving behind for us. I would, I would echo that, that her ability to speak about the community Although she was not a potter, her ability to speak about the community and the place of pottery and its relationship with the outside world uh, was a tremendous asset to the to the exhibition. And I think that uh, her loss is great for all communities. Um, it really is. Um, one of the things that you know she held in her hand. She's the person in the in the film you just saw. If you're not familiar with it, that I actually put a Tanita Royball pot into her hand. Um, and um, she had never held one of her grandmother's pots, if you could imagine that, that uh, having such um, a well-known, famous parentage that uh, comes from an important family and all those things, yet she's never had the opportunity to hold that piece in her hand. Uh, and the same with Eva Monquino, Monquino, that she also had never held one of her uh, grandfather's pot, Crescencio Martinez. The opportunity to um, to, to work with people and to share the collections with them is of tremendous importance. And going back to the history of the museum, the San Ildefonso collections are the first collections of the Museum of New Mexico and School for Advanced Research. Uh, when, the, when those two organizations were formed together in tandem in the early, early part of the 20th century, it was San Ildefonso who the first director Edgar Heward turned to and really got a direction of the sort of ethics and ethos the way museums should uh, um, should should be attendant to its uh, to the geog geography and to the people of New Mexico, and they took a lot of cues from those from those days. Hewitt took a lot of cues from those days. He certainly mashed them up into his own mixture later on. That's another discussion for another time. But those collections then serve as that friendship that created the museum, and they're very very important. And one of the things that we really tried to do through the exhibit is put the pottery, uh, put the pottery collections back in people's hands where they could speak about those collections. One of the other things I just would quickly add to Eric's point about the flu in 1918, which is so much in the forefront of everybody's mind right now, is how Hewitt, in working with the community, ignored the majority of the community. And what I mean by that, again, is he worked with very few families. Now, whether the families there was a great pottery tradition already, tradition and heritage already ongoing in 1907, 198, when he famously had to hand that potter that shirt to get her to make pottery again. That's not at all true. There are, there are, there are um, probably about 25 or 30 potters at that time who were making some of really the very best pottery of, of the generation. It's in the Renaissance that had been, go been going on since the 1870s. He steps into the very end of that into that period of great creativity. Um, but you have to wonder why he, he didn't really involve the whole community. Yet he collected from the community and other collections, other places. So those were some of the ways we could share uh, back from the outside of the museum perspective back to the community about some of those people. Absolutely, that's a really good point. And I think um, the fact that Hewitt ignored most of the community is something that we really can't forget throughout all of these conversations. So a huge idea that's throughout the exhibition is this idea that pottery 
reflects community. So can you talk about this concept and how the idea of community is maybe presented in the exhibit? Because um, a lot of ways pottery functions like a social tool, right? Well, I, I think I think pottery can reflect. It, it does certainly reflect the community, but I think the the burden that we place on on pottery and ceramics is is heavy for those for those materials, because remember, like pottery, it's it's one of the most abundant things in museum collections, not just at Mayak, but at any museum, and even in archaeological context or from archaeological places or ancestral places it's one of the most resilient materials even when it's smashed and broken into tiny pieces uh, you can still learn a lot from pottery um, and it's one of the most abundant things anywhere that museums have but it's just a small piece of maybe not maybe that's not the right right word but it's just one aspect of Pueblo culture, I think, and there's a lot of other, um, not just materials, but um, I think stories, things that accompany uh, Pueblo culture that, that also have a lot to say. So I think um, the burden is heavy for pottery. There's a lot that it can tell us. There's a lot that it can't tell us. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that point that, um, that with pottery, we're learning a lot, but we're also not getting the full breadth of what um, of, uh, of, uh, of Pueblo society. Um, but it's, it's good to have these voices that can accompany pottery, like myself or Eric or Russell or all those other people you see in those videos, because they give voice to the pots where they can't give voices themselves. Um, so I think that's really important um, point to make is that uh, pottery alone can't can't tell the story. You know, you need people um, to accompany the pottery. As a potter, do you want to respond to the heavy burden? That we <laughs> well, I think with pottery, you can you know that sense of community that sense of family. Um, it's a little easier with pottery paint and painting actually um, to kind of, even though the pots aren't signed, you know, you kind of look at a piece and you can kind of tell what well, this may be was this individual that made this piece. This individual made it, but this indiv individual painted it. And so you're able to piece together um, some of the history, the, some of the stories, some of the uh, family lineages that are um, within the community and able to tie, you know, who's related to who and who was, who was this person, who was that person because of pottery. So it's a great tool that um, we're able to, to use and utilize in also telling stories and telling uh, showing family histories and showing uh, lineage and um, things like that. So, I think that's a really those are really good points, and I think that you know there's a fascination of the outside world uh, with who made that pot and the signatures on pots, which is a very very much 20th century market driven, economically driven activity. Before that time, like the majority of the pottery in in the collection of the museum pots were not signed. And um, you can sort them into groups. We did a lot of this in preparation for the exhibit and a lot of questions of one another. We sorted them into groups and um, they clearly have a relationship. They're, they're clearly family units or some type of units of some type, but identifying each pot by name uh, is, is not possible all the time. I think uh, also that, that, that uh, tells us something about the community basis for pottery, that you weren't supposed to tell one person's work from another, but it was a group of people working together. And it might well have been a pot built, the clay built by one person and painted by another. And if you're familiar with the way that um, people have written about uh, the community and the despair people express about somebody signed the pot, or they weren't the maker or somebody helped with the pot, 
And so there should be two signatures and all the rest of that. All that dissolves if you look at the community basis of pottery. And that's one of the other aspects of the, of the exhibition. One of the great challenges we had, a lot of fun, but great challenges, was sorting things into family groups and then putting them out in the cases uh, for people to enjoy them. I don't know what you thought about the, the, case, the cases of pottery, Eric. Um, I'm not sure we came out all with 100% agreement on the, um, which family was which pot, but maybe you could comment on what you thought of when you saw the exhibit um, opened like that. Well, I guess, the, um, you know, once we got over our hurdles and finally decided on which pieces were gonna be in the exhibit, you know, it, it, it made a lot of sense as far as, you know, this family or that family or this style or, you know, whatever it was. And it was just a, um, a good way to show the progression and the history of the pottery and the community. You know, not so much um, talking about one person or another, but, you know, showing that, like I said earlier, the, the diversity of the wares that were being produced within San Alfonso Pueblo with very few potters doing it. So, you know, it was, mm -hmm. a, it was a good way to just show that, that, um, that, like I said, the diversity of pottery. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's a good segue into talking about the process of putting the exhibit together. Um, so now that um, we have a little bit of overview about the exhibition's content as well as its context, I'd like to back up and kind of ask everybody about the process of creating the show and the show's implications for the community at San I. Um, so I guess to start this part of the conversation off, where did the idea for the exhibit come from and how did you work together and in partnership with community members. Eric and Woody, um, you've talked about the fact that museums still hold a stigma within the community. So it would be great to talk about how um, that was navigated. Well, I, I, was, I was kind of on the kind of periphery in the actual exhibit design um, when, it, when it came to like the nuts and bolts of like selecting individual pots and placement of them in cases and such. But, what I witnessed with this with this exhibit that was pretty unique um, to any other kind of uh, exhibit um, exhibition that I've that I've worked on was the level of community involvement and the the really close attention paid to to community voices. So, for example, we we saw short clips of. Um, of people uh, speaking in the in the basements of of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, holding those um, the pots of their family members, their past family members, but th those really were were much more involved. There were longer interviews. Um, the really the museum team, the mu museum. Uh, people, I'll say, uh, and, and Bruce as one of the, the lead curators, really developed a, a relationship with uh, the community members that went beyond a museum person and a museum uh, collaborating. You know, we, we sometimes we hear this word a lot these days, uh, collaboration, but what does it mean to collaborate? I think what happened with this exhibit, you really had community buy-in and you had museum buy-in. So there was buy-in on both sides where the project really transcended this idea of uh, collaboration to create a partnership. And if you were there on any of the, there was tons of Sinai people there on the opening day. Like we basically took over the courtyard, the the exhibit space. Um, it was a, it was an all day affair, um, and it was really fun, and it was really just kind of really neat to see the Pueblo invested in in that in that project. Um, so I mean, yeah, I I've yet to see any kind of other um, exhibit really just kind of embrace um, the community in that way. So that that was my personal experience. Maybe Eric um, as a as a curator yourself, you um, you might have a different perspective. Yeah, well, the the whole process, you know, it was um, 
I guess you'd say in a way was a lot different than what I originally envisioned or or thought that you know putting an exhibit together would be. There's a lot more um, jump uh, hoops to jump through um, and things to get done. You know, um, it was not like you just go in there. So okay, let's put this pot, this pot, this pot, that pot. You know, there's a lot more to it. Um, but at the same time, it was a really good learning experience for myself. And um, I enjoyed, you know, being down in the basement in the collections, being with amongst all those pots and being able to um, choose and, you know, have discussions about certain pieces or whatnot. But, you know, it was a really great experience. And I think like Woody said, you know, the community, the buy-in from the community, you know, it was, uh, it was tremendous. It was, you know, there was a lot of people that came out, showed a lot of respect for, for what was done and a lot of appreciation, you know, and this still goes back to what I talk about is showing, you know, community, you know, the family, um, people that came, you know, that we're to, able to connect with with family from the past because to us that's what the pots are is you know pottery they're living entities to us we consider them in a, as a living life form and you know so those are our relatives whether we know who they are or not so it was still a way to connect with family and it was just a, a really great process with Bruce, the staff there at Mayak, Russell, and being able to, um, like Woody said, to have a real collaboration, I guess you'd say, um, between ourselves, or the community, and the museum. And, um, you know, it was just, uh, like I said, a really, a really great experience. Something that I hope to do again one of these days. And I think a great thread between what you're both saying is this idea of restructuring expertise within the museum, right? I mean, Eric, as a potter or as a Sanai community member, you are an expert on these pieces more so than I could ever be, right? So I think expertise is a really powerful concept. And in the exhibit, power is explicitly taken away from the non-native archaeologists, anthropologists, and curators, and reinscribe to potters in the community. So I think that's something that maybe we could talk a little bit more about why it's so important to make that visible. Well, I would start that discussion just say what an honor and privilege it is to work with people uh, like this and to work in a partnership. And to if we're if at, as an outsider, I think community members too want an accurate, accurate history told of their community. Anybody wants accuracy about their family and their community. There are also other aspects, things are talked about, things aren't talked about in any family from any place. So being in that privileged or honored position to listen to people, to hear about things. The one of the things, Miss Laura, um, during the filming, when we were filming at Russell's house, one of the things I asked a question, she said, that's not even a question. Uh, and just put, put me clearly in my place as a, as, as a really beginner in any way into the community and the types of questions we can and can't ask as much as I might have a degree or whatever else. So what is a role of someone like myself? I really think it comes down to two things. One, first of all, is being an expert in museums, how the museums work. So the hoops that Eric and Russell, in particular with this exhibit, are lessened there's fewer hoops for them to jump through, that there are times before they come or side conversations that, that I clear, clear a pathway so we don't have to go through some, some of the things that museums do by their own practice. Also encouraging the museum not to have so many hoops for people to work with them, I think is another thing. The other thing, if Russell was here, and I would echo Russell's sentiments 100% on this, that everything we know about pottery is basically wrong in some fashion. Everything we know as outsiders, museum people, is wrong in some way. So how do we begin to wipe the slate clean and begin to rewrite that history, that understanding from the viewpoint of the community? And I think that was one of the most important 
uh, things about the exhibition that we could come forward with uh, was is that uh, just to break down some of those preconceived ideas about things, about names, whether it's names or families, the relative importance of one person over another. It's all about the community working together and understanding how the community has survived and thrived through centuries of outsiders by being a community of people. Yeah, I think that's a really important point that everything that you think you know is incorrect and how do you work to rewrite that history and I think a key point in trying to answer that question is the question of access. Um, there's a stat out there that most museums only display two to four percent of their collection, which is really honestly staggering if you think about the amount of items that museums hold. Um, and Mayak is of course no exception. So I was wondering if we could talk about why it's so important to bring pieces out of storage rooms and to the museum's different publics. Um, so fundamentally, how and why is access important? You know, with this exhibit, the, like you said, the statistics that you're mentioning, you know, probably greater than 90% of these pots that are in this exhibit had never been seen by the public. And it's a way to, like I say, to, to show, again, diversity. Um, I heard comments from other people that saw the exhibit and, you know, the history, we go back to the history of pottery, um, that, you know, when you think of San Alfonso Pueblo, first thing that comes to mind is black on black pottery. And when they saw some of these pieces, they're like, no, those aren't Sanai, those aren't black, those aren't, you know. And there's people that never knew that Sanai, traditional Sanai pottery was polychrome, black on red, and plainware in the, you know, from the beginning. And black on black pottery is something, you know, it's just, just like 100 years old, a little over 100 years old, probably. Um, but that's the, you know, like Bruce said, you know, the everything that's wrong that people know about pottery. And even within other tribal communities, you know, other tribal members, uh, tribal members from other Pueblos, you know, had, had commented that, well, I didn't know Sanai made that, that type of pottery. Or, you know, being that close working with the pottery you know, I've been really inspired in my work and um, trying to re recreate some of these styles, the black on red and um, black on red and polychrome styles. But then when other people see them, you know, they're like, oh, you're copying other Pueblos and, or different, you know, whatever, but it's not, uh, um, it's not that it's just like I tell people these are the traditional styles and so the access getting into the museum getting into collections you know for me has been a really you know a major influence in my work that I'm doing now a, a real uh, great inspiration and um, you know following in family footsteps I guess but um but yeah yeah, and I think when we talk about access, I think it's important. It's it's really important to to allow. I mean, you know, community members, public people shouldn't have to gain permission to access their own cultural heritage and cultural patrimony. So I, I think we have to view um, access in different terms, not museums allowing or giving permission to community members to to kind of engage with their cultural patrimony but we have to kind of re reset the stage so to speak on on how uh, communities and how museums kind of work together to to create uh, partnerships that go beyond um that go beyond exhibits because this this exhibit is it was special you know it's it it's, it's only up for a year. Um, there was a lot of good things that happened prior to the exhibit going on, like this whole process of that Eric Russell and some of the other curators went through 
to, to put the exhibit together. Um, it was up for a year. Now we're having this awesome discussion to close out the exhibit. Uh, but what happens after that, you know? Um, the, the way we as Pueblo people um, uh, uh, should be able to engage with, with these types of collections should go beyond uh, exhibitions or, um, you know, these kind of special events. There, there needs to be some type of process to, to allow folks to, to, to engage with these materials. Um, and I think a place like Mayak is, is well positioned to, to kind of foster that, that type of partnership, um, you know, cause we're close, you know, they're, they're, they're in the heart of, of public country. And although there's museums across the country, across the world that have, uh, you know, Pueblo materials, it's harder to physically access those, even if, if uh, there was some kind of process to, to do so. Um, so I think, you know, the, the exhibit and what Maya could do moving forward as far as uh, partnering with, with public communities or um, any other, you know, native community um, uh, whose who's the culture heritage they, they uh, are stewards of, um, I think there's an opportunity there to create something that goes beyond exhibits so that we can have this feeling uh, that we had in the exhibit during the process of creating the exhibit and while the exhibit was up all the time, not just during this like special moment of the exhibit that is short lived um, and has a, a finite um, kind of end to it. Um, so, I, you know, I think Mayak museums elsewhere, new museums, um, up and coming museums, um, I think there's a lot to say about how how they engage with communities going forward. I think that really hits the heart of what we want to talk about today, um, which is really what is the museum's responsibility to the San Ildefonso community? That's a great question. You know, and Mayak um, has a nice brief history of working with people. I, again, I would go back to the first decade or so of the museum system. Um, from that sort of 1910 to 1920 period, and look at the way that there was a symbiotic relationship between Pueblo communities, in particular San Ildefonso, and the in the um, in the museum. Without uh, San Ildefonso, there may not have been a museum, uh, in the sense that uh, not just who people were at that particular time, but the museum totally 100% relied upon San Ildefonso people, a few other people, but primarily. San Alfonso people to uh, walk with them through the Pajarito and the Hamas ranges and talk to them about what was being seen and um, and different things like that. Shared and shared a great deal. People have always been generous. Um, and then you know what? My fast forwarding to the to eighties, nineties, the development of here now and always was another tiny step uh, in the sense of involving people to tell their own stories. The museum to step back and make the space for people to tell the stories. So the natural progression of, of the collections themselves is something I've had, I've had an opportunity to, to build a, a collections and research building in DC in which we put more of these principles into, into play. But here again, as uh, as has been acknowledged today, we're in the we're in the midst of Tewa people and Tewa homelands. We have a a terrific opportunity to model what could happen. So one of the conversations I've had with uh, Matthew Martinez, the deputy, is so what happens when the pots move from upstairs on exhibit and of necessity because of the rotation of exhibits and so forth, what happens when they go back downstairs? Are they organized according to some anthropological idea, according to size or color or something? Or are they put back and reorganized on the shelves according to family? It's the same question that Eric, Russell, and I also asked uh, the School for Advanced Research, Indian Arts Research Center, was what about reorganizing the pottery to make sense to San Alfonso people to come in? And, and um, what would that take to do those types of things? And, that, and that's kind of the next steps, is to look at those things. I think there is a usability of museum collections for Native people. I think it's a very, difficult, fraught relationship between the community, native communities 
and museums. There is no doubt about that. But I think that with, with some uh, good work, healing work, that there could be a better relationship. And part of that is the usability. If we looked across all the San Alfonso collections and museums, uh, larger, not just one or two things, but bigger collections in New York, Washington, here in Santa Fe, we might be able to, to uh, and with community input, it begins to tell a full story. Um, and those are the types of things, those are the type of interventions that I think that the, the exhibit, I hope, points the way to. I think there's a, also a responsibility, like for folks like myself, um, you know, as anthropologists, um, and perhaps Eric as an artist who, you know, we're, we're familiar with these, these museums, um, but a lot of our community members aren't. Um, I mean, you, you saw in, in the video that, um, you know, Eva Mokino, for example, had no idea that her, her grandfather's pots were there. And you, you could talk to a handful of, of folks here in the Pueblo uh, who have no idea that these collections even exist. Um, so be, before we can even access these collections, we, we have to become educated about these collections, um, how, they how they became uh, to be uh, in the museum anthropology world, um, why they're there, um, what's there. I mean, museums themselves sometimes don't even know like what the heck they have in their own basements. Um, so there's a responsibility, I think, on uh, for both for both native people and museums um, to 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 kind of help let these collections um, become more usable. Like like Bruce said, I think there's a usability of these, but it's like finding the appropriate and, and proper usability of these uh, collections. I, I think we can manage that um, if we just put our, our heads together. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, and just the idea of reorganizing the collection in a way that inherently makes sense to San Defonso folks is a really, like, that's going beyond this idea of access and permission towards genuine partnership and collaboration. So um, to kind of round out this part of the conversation, I wanted to kind of switch the lens a little bit and ask from each of your own perspectives, um, what does the exhibition mean to the community or to your community? You know, and it, it all goes back to what I've said already, you know, that community, the, the feeling, the family, family legacy, tying into the past and um, you know it's really important that we continue these uh, traditions and hoping that that this exhibit would maybe spark something in somebody coming up that's wanting to do pottery but they're not sure they're not um, they're not too comfortable or whatever it is whatever they're whatever's holding them back to, that this would be uh, a way to get them to move into into doing it to to continuing the the art that uh, is basically I mean it's you look at our community now there's a handful of potters that are active and um, at one time you know I can remember growing up that you know come August people getting ready for Indian market you know it was almost every other house where people were firing pottery and now like I said it, it's it's really gone down the number of potters active potters but yet we're so well known for pottery so in a way you know like I said I'm hoping that this would be inspiration to somebody that has aspirations of becoming a potter and moving forward and, and continuing this this art this craft and um, being able to to use what's there at the museum again like I did as inspiration and I, I think for me um, what 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 was important about this uh, particular uh, exhibit is the the process by which it came about um, cause I think to me the, the the process is just as important if not more important than the outcome. So what you see in the exhibit, um, you know, it just didn't happen. Uh, these, these beautiful pieces of pottery just didn't come into place. 
um, you know, by, by some chance. There's a lot of work that was done uh, leading up to that exhibit, a lot of conversations, a lot of interviews, a lot of people engaging with the collections, um, you know, a, a lot of bureaucratic stuff that had to happen. There's all these different mechanisms that that had to fall into place to to get this really nice, well done exhibit that that you see on display in the space. Um, and if if any of that was done uh, not done in, in, with the right um, kind of attitude or the right approach or with the right intentions, then the final result wouldn't be what it is. Um, so, so for me, as a as a public person, as an anthropologist, uh, I, I find the the process of of, uh, of creating these types of exhibits and engaging uh, the engagement between people um, is really important. And uh, if it's done well, then you can have all these things that um, you know some of the things that Eric is talking about. It, it could it could uh, exhibit like this can inspire people to. Uh, revive a certain type of pottery or pick up the art um, and it'll just a, a well done process can lead to a lot of really good things not just in museums but in lots of aspects of life um, so so for me it's it's the process uh, thank you both um, those are great answers I think that um, I clearly have a slightly different answer being a non-native person and um, you know, as a PhD anthropologist and as a museum person, um, I very strongly and have throughout my career and life worked towards being part of change and opening doors, creating spaces for people where there previously had not been space. And I think that it is not, there's no product from that. I can't point to one thing that is that, but I can point to, as Woody just said, the word process. It's a long process to untie so many deep knots from the anthropological museum community. And we have to keep working on untying those. And at the same time as we're untying those or making space for people, also uh, listening and hearing very carefully what communities are saying, what they might want or need from the collections. The inspiration is certainly a big piece of that in both Russell and Eric, as we went around and look at collections, uh, made fantastic pieces inspired by visits, inspired by their families. Um, and why shouldn't it be that way that they find that inspiration? And also understand that that inspiration is inspiration, not copying, not replicating, but inspiration because things move forward all the time. And I think though that's a, that's a big part of what happens, this deeper learning about history. I think that uh, um, as people become more dispersed and there's more of a power of social media, how do people continue to learn about their, their own lives and their own communities, I think is important. Um, so those are some of the, some of the things that are, are very clear um, uh, out of the exhibition. I think that uh, I have a very important piece of this work, of, of this portion of the work that's not done yet, that's on my shoulders, which is finishing this book. And I know that very well. And interesting, I've written most of it except the sort of uh, the text that go with the um, all the illustrations, so all the pottery. There'll be about 300 pieces of pottery in the book, um, and to um, that's the part that's I've slowed on for whatever reason. So, but that will be out next year in 2021. We'll see that. And hopefully, that's a inspiration to the communities too. They can be at home and look through a physical book together and enjoy enjoy what the community has has accomplished over the years. That was one of our first questions um, from Rob, asked what the status of the book was. That's so, it. <laughs> jump the gun. Um, but I think both of those points about process over product and, and have, having the museum be a space for, as for inspiration for younger potters is incredibly important and really points us towards thinking more about the role of the museum um, as we're moving forward and notions of repair between the community and the institution. Um, so I think if it works for you guys, we can start going through some of the questions. Uh, there's anything else, Woody or Eric, you wanted to say something you guys missed on here? Uh, no, I, I think I'm, I'm hoping that the 
question and answer session will generate some thoughts. Okay. And some okay. good questions. So the first question we have is from Art, who asks, why can't you say her name? <laughs> you mean Maria Martinez, obviously. <laughs> um, hey, Art, uh, Art Wolf, how are you? Thank you for listening. The reason for that is not that Maria Martinez uh, was a great potter and inspired generations of potters. That's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but it's the emphasis on her name by the outside world. So it's not a no, her name is in the exhibition. Uh, she, there's a whole big area dedicated to her, her and her family and her potting uh, husband as well. Um, but we've always focused on them because the museum focused on them and made them the only people that revitalized this pottery. So what we've tried to do is take a step back from that and look more holistically at the entire community. In the film piece we started with, Barbara Gonzalez is her great, great granddaughter, I think is the right number of greats. Uh, and she lived with Maria and learned a great deal from her. We've included as many families as we can. We're not excluding anyone. We're just trying to get people to think about other names like Ignacia Sanchez. Um, you know, people that maybe the names aren't as familiar and not fill people back up with the same names I've he heard for many, many years. Uh, but she obviously is in the midst of all of the things that we've talked about today. Eric, as a potter, do you want to talk about that a little bit more? <laughs> well, I guess, you know, like Bruce said, you know, it's not that we try to exclude anybody or anything. I mean, Maria, she's my great grandmother's sister. And so she's family. But, um, you know, it's not. Like I said earlier, San Alfonso known for black on black pottery and Maria Martinez. But there's more to the history of the pottery. There's more to the legacy of pottery than black on black pottery and that name and, and Maria Martinez. Um, you know, it goes back further. I mean, if, if, if you look at the video that was done of Maria Martinez, um, well, it was in the 70s, I believe. Um, you know, she, even in that, she, you know, she talks about learning from her aunt and it's those people that we wanted to, to bring their story out. You know, Maria's, yes, she's part of it. And, but she's at the tail end of this story that we're trying to tell. And the, you know, it, she wasn't the beginning, you know, so it's, 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 it's important for people to understand that there's more to San Alfonso pottery than just black on black and Maria Martinez. Absolutely. Um, so a question from Matthew, what was left out of the exhibit that you feel is critical, is a critical piece of the pottery tradition at San Alfonso? About 200 pots. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more than that, right? <laughs> I think that we would have, we had originally planned to include pots from the Indian Arts Fund, which is in another institution here in town, but we're unable to do that because of the loan situation. Would have been great to put all those pots together. I think too, like Eric, I think, but I'd say 400 pots we left out. Um, I think just being able to put them all out. I'd also, because exhibitions are so product oriented that they're they look like they're finished thinking it would have been great to have the time to um, walk as we had originally planned but COVID clearly has changed a lot of plans for for all people we really wanted to walk through the exhibit with different people from the community and hear what people have to say uh, it's like when Eva came to um, to the museum she brought some pictures of her grandfather with her to share with us that, because we no one had ever seen those photos before. Um, you know, there were things like that, that how do you, how you then go back? So you have this exhibition, can you have people involved once you put it up with the thinking, have community intellects like these two guys and, and Russell and others talk with the community and re and redo parts of the exhibition, whether it's just putting new text or new uh, iPads on, on the fronts of cases, 
or shuffling the pots around, whatever that might be, that would have been a great circumstance um, to, to really get the community involved in terms of what, what uh, the exhibition was talking about. You asked Matthew, that's what the best thing would be. <laughs> um, so the next question, the next few questions are kind of- you know, What do you answer that? I'd be interested in who, what do you have to say okay. about that? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Don't let them out. You can read them, Lilia, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the questions are, why is a relationship with museums fraught um, between communities and institutions? Do they need to hire different people? And the second part of the question is, what do we really gain from critiquing the founders of the Museum of New Mexico system and their associates? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a heavy question. Um, well, I, I, I assume art is talking about the relationship uh, of native communities uh, with museums and why that um, may or may not be fraught. Uh, and I think there's, it goes beyond just hi hiring uh, different people. There's, there's a long, long leg legacy uh, amongst native communities and uh, settler colonialism, which, it, which museums really come down to. They, they, they are rooted in the idea of settler colonialism and, and the other and the collection of um, and fascination uh, with with native people and the things that uh, that they think represent native culture and so we've certainly come a long way in the you know 100 plus years or so um, since anthropology and the creation of many of museums in the US uh, to to, to kind of mending that relationship, but the damage has been done long ago. And this, this goes beyond uh, uh, material collections, um, object collections like pottery or, or other types of cultural patrimony. This, this goes to even human remains um, because the museums we're talking about that, that hold pottery collections, a lot of them also hold human remains and other sacred objects um, that belong back in the rightful places or their rightful communities. So the relationships between native communities um, and museums should understandably be fraught, um, but it's, it's what, are, what are we doing to, 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 to mend that relationship? Um, there's a lot that has to happen that goes beyond just hiring different people. Um, and part of, part of what I think can be done are things like this exhibit, you know, just kind of creating spaces where dialogue um, and interaction can happen between museums and communities uh, where you can begin to create relationships and talk about um, why it's fraught um, so we can come to some kind of mutual understanding so we can move move, uh, move forward i know that sounds a little ideal um but you know there's there's other routes that um you know tribes can take through some formal processes to to re to engage with museums but i think if museums and and community native communities can aside from any kind of formal process come together to create that relationship, I think that can go a long way. And do we want to talk briefly about the second part of that question? Maybe Bruce, um, talk about what you get from what kind of the value of critiquing the history of the institution. Oh, sure. Uh, I think to add to Woody's comments, I think that, um, you know, when uh, museums have collected the remains of ancestors and other objects they should not have, and I don't think there's it doesn't take any stretch of the imagination to understand how Native people conflate the two. I think that's very true. And I think that museums continue to hold those collections. There are avenues for return of, uh, um, of collections and remains through what's called NAGPRAs. Many of our people listening probably know. Um, and, uh, but there is a great much, many more things that are 
cultural patrimony. So in a NAGPRA situation, just say there's a thousand things and three or four things are sent home through NAGPRA, what about the other 996 pieces? And how is that relationship built around those? And it's an evolving in partnership, perhaps, or some type of stewardship. And even the definition of stewardship, is it defined by the museum or is it defined uh, by the community? Is it episodic from the museum or is it more long-term from the community? Are there uh, memorandums of understanding or agreement between communities and museums? Just what exactly uh, is in place to help communities understand? There are things that I would say in the vast amount of, I'm going out on a limb a little bit, but the vast amount of San Alfonso pottery collections, let's just focus on pottery for a moment, the vast amount is, are things that were purchased from people. Now, that might be something made for the outside world beginning in the 1880s, people made and sold things to the Smithsonian and the American Museum of Natural History and to the museum and the school and the Indian Arts Fund. And there are those pieces that get sold out. There are a few pieces here and there that the person who sold it perhaps should not have sold that particular piece. They took something personally and sold something that was to communities. There are also other things that happen in the community. And I think both Eric and, and, and Woody know, I've talked about this before, that there are very, very few large uh, uh, storage vessels out, sold out of the community pre-1909, 1910. And then about 1909, 1910, things changed dramatically. And suddenly, uh, a lot of storage vessels are sold outside of the museum. Now, we can try and understand that from the outside, but the only possible explanation of that rests inside the community. But to understand what that is, and even Let's say it has something to do with drought, which it might, has to do with water access, which it might, and farm fields, uh, that people's livelihoods were being very much threatened um, um, by the change from territorial to federal government, um, statehood, um, and that people um, sold things, like legally sold things. However, what duress were they under to sell those things? So, so those are some of the things that still very much exist in those spaces on those museum shelves. And I don't think uh, we can ignore that. What, and what good does it do to go back and, and reanalyze um, the, begin, the founding? I do think that it goes along with the things we've talked about today in understanding, if we understand, uh, if we think that everything we know uh, about pottery, for example, might be wrong, then what are the constructs of anthropology in museums? What are those constructs we have that people have said, this community is like this or that and so forth, then, um, then there's no reason uh, to resist the temptation to go and talk about the early history of the museum and how the museum has told its story, Hewitt basically has told his story about how he did one thing and another thing and how he solved the problems of the community by doing this or that. Um, and, um, but what about the community telling that story itself you know, why did they agree to go with him, the Pajarito? Why did those particular men go up, 18 of the 20 in 1907, 1908, or from San Alfonso? Why is that? Why is San Alfonso open to um, sending uh, its young men to go up there and to support Hewitt in some ways? Those are questions that only come from the community, and those questions have never really been answered, or maybe never will be. And until we know the full story, we don't know much of the story at all. So I think it's important to, to relook at those early histories, understand what we can correct today and uh, what we need to correct today. That's it. Eric, do you want to jump in on that at all? I think Bruce and Woody covered pretty good. Um, I, I will say, you know, there has been, um, you know, to add further, um, The stigma that we talked about a little earlier too, um, at the beginning, you know, there's that stigma of uh, museums, the collections, you know, there's uh, the, how they came about, you know, even within our communities, maybe people don't understand the full story. So there's always the thought of, oh, well, everything in museums was taken, stolen, or it's grave goods, human remains. So it, things like that. So on one end, it's it's our own community, 
that um, kind of shy away and pull back. But then at the same time, you know, you have institutions that, you know, they say, okay, we're going to do um, consultation. And then they, they send a paper, a letter with uh, listing several items, and that's what they consider consultation. But yet they don't hear the stories or they don't know the true history and it's um, a lot of times there's pushback from the community because it's these institutions that are telling us our history and telling us well this is how it was but when we know different and so there's that um, back and forth the you know the responsibility goes back and forth and it falls on not only the institutions the museum's shoulders but community also so yeah and I think that point about um, just sending a letter and then expecting information you know and lit or listening without really absorbing or processing what community members are saying is a really important point especially when we're thinking about what collaboration actually means um, yeah so the next question that I have well we're actually out of time um, but I have two more questions if you guys want to stay on or sure. okay um but if you're an attendee and you have to go um we understand <laughs> um so this eric i assume this question um would go to you can you talk a little bit more about the large storage pots um they're breathtaking do you have a um, any information on where they're from or if the families were identified and why were they so huge well the you know, some of the pieces were identified, but um, and that's one of the things with this exhibit that we tried not to, um, although being a potter, being from the community, and like I said earlier, being able to look at pieces and say, okay, well, maybe that's this family or that family, we tried, you know, to make sure that we didn't identify, we used pieces that were not signed and um, that were, less identifiable i guess to 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 convey that um message of community and not individuals but um you know the large storage jars that you see in that exhibit um especially that one room um i know a lot of those were done because of the the need to store wheat you know large pots were made after the introduction of wheat and the the whole whole you know the, i mean wheat in itself is just another whole tangent and another whole story that you know it's a i mean we could probably do an exhibit on on the introduction of wheat into the community into the pueblos um but those were you know used to store basically for storing wheat um and right you know a lot of them are a lot older that we have no idea who made them but um you know that's one of the things um that myself as a potter you know you look at the community now you know there's not many potters that build large pieces but that's something my family that was known for is building large pieces and that's something that i continue to do Eric, Eric Russell and I uh, wrote a, um, a paper about the changes in these large pots um, coming into being in the middle part of the 1700s and having to do with wheat agriculture and some changes in the communities uh, that were a result of the revolt and circumstances following the revolt. Um, also, many of those pots are painted by men. We also talk about that aspect of them and why they were painted by men. And um, if you would like, uh, just shoot me a note. My email is simple, bernsteinbruce at gmail, uh, and I can make sure you get a copy of that particular paper uh, that, that we wrote, so. That's great, thank you, Bruce. Um, so the last question that I wanna go into is from Emily, and she asks how Mayak collecting practices have changed throughout the years to directly support dynamic, innovative, living Native American artists. I'm not sure if any of us can directly speak to that, um, but maybe Bruce, but I think maybe I'll broaden the question to how my collecting, collecting practices should change. 
Well, I will, I'll start the answer, but I really think Eric and Woody need to answer that. So museums inherit great historic collections, basically. And uh, even if Mayak was to collect only contemporary, they'd only have the tip of all the great things going on today. So one of the things, um, the pottery collections when I arrived at Mayak were about 4,000 pieces, and we added about 1,000 contemporary pieces. So just 20%, that's still not uh, very much over overall to the collection. And um, in, in every program, we tried to add pottery. So museum really relies on um, acquisitions. And I can't tell you all the great, wonderful pleasures of taking family members in to see their community's pottery, all, all the great comments and just the joy of it, the tears of it. Um, what better purpose for the museum uh, than that? Again, in the middle of all this, and all these great pottery collections over the last 30, 40 years, how many of those are landing in Santa Fe? And I'll just, for, for Matthew, just for a moment, um, if they all came to my act, they'd get a new wing to, to put all these collections on view all the time. Not a bad thing, uh, but what does it feel like? I guess, let me just direct at you, Eric. Uh, you know, you're making pottery now. You, you're, you, you, um, you help out with market, for example and your pieces are in museum collections. Talk a little bit about this aspect of contemporary collections and correcting the historic uh, tangent of museums to a much more holistic one. Oh gosh. Ah, <laughs> oh, you um, can do it, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of um, at a loss now. Um, you know, when I look at museum collections, to me, that's still, I guess, historic work. Um, but yes, moving forward, you know, I'm going to be history one of these days. You know, I'm not going to live forever. So, you know, if the museum were to purchase pieces or people donated to the collection there, um, you know, then fine, but it's not, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I just really haven't thought about this um, aspect of, of the work that I do or, or, you know, am I gonna be, you know, 100 years from now, is, am I, is one of my end, um, descendants gonna be saying the same thing, you know? Oh, I got to see my great, great, great grandfather's piece. Uh, you know, I just never dawned on me or I just never thought about it in that way, so. Um, like I said, I'm kind of at a loss right now. Bruce putting me on the spot. Woody, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think so. Just to add to what what Eric said and to address the question, um, I mean, anecdotally, just just from my experience of visiting Mayak, uh, not just Mayak but other museums and. You can see that the the collections are beginning to diversify and and are more reflective of uh, contemporary um, native communities. Um, I mean, you just have to go in and and look at the the kind of the rotating exhibits at Mayak on on any like a yearly basis um, and see kind of the the cool the cool kind of new contemporary uh, works that they're including as part of those exhibits that are not just standalone contemporary, but like uh, that are in conjunction or on display with, with uh, like earlier or historic um, objects. I'm just thinking back to the, the turquoise exhibit at Mayak, you know, there was a lot of cool contemporary turquoise uh, jewelry in that exhibit. And I think, in the space where the pottery exhibit is now, there's like a, a I understand a new uh, exhibit focusing on um, another aspect of contemporary native art. So I, I think Mayak in particular has um, evolved with the times, um, and it's good to see that they're they're adapting and 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 uh, curating, uh, collecting um, contemporary native art. And and I'll say just having experience in um, 
and working with Mayak on other projects uh, and helping to redesign the new permanent Southwest exhibit. Um, you know, there, there's a whole other section of, of Mayak's um, basement that, that holds these new contemporary uh, collections of native art. Um, but like Lilia said, um, you know, we only see a small percentage of this stuff. So, uh, I, you know, the, the museum is confined by the space that it sits inside of, uh, those, those four walls of the exhibit or however many walls of the exhibit. Um, so there's only so much room to, to, to um, provide the, the exhibition of, of some of those um, contemporary exhibits or collections. Um, but they're there, and I, I'd really like to see more of those as uh, museums move forward. Uh, I just, I would just add two um, brief things to what the what uh, Woody and Eric have said. You know, when uh, first Indian Market named its Indian Fair in 1922, uh, they did not allow black on black pottery to be judged because they felt it was too new and too innovative at that time. So things do change. And along those lines, uh, one of the great contemporary exhibits right now is Diego Romero's exhibition. Really terrific, wonderful. And I once was talking with Diego and I asked him about how he wanted to see his pottery, you know, years from now, 100 years, 10,000 years. And he said he wanted people to see his pottery nestled in with all the other pottery from Pueblo communities, not standing out from, but nestling in. So I think the idea of continuity, historic to contemporary, is important that you'll, one can only understand some of the basic principles of, of Pueblo villages by understanding what they see in pottery is this continuity over a great deal of time, even when they're looking at their great-grandfather Eric's pottery uh, 50 years from now. I mean, they'll see it as being from a community being consistent with pottery, and that's one of the great powers of pottery is being a, um, a narrator for, for us. I think that is a great place to end unless everybody, anyone else has some closing thoughts. No, just wanna thank the attendees and the other <laughs> panelists for a great session. Right. Yes, thank you everyone for taking your time out today. Thanks for the great questions. Yeah. Thank you, Eric and Woody yeah. uh, and Russell and Lilia and Matthew in the museum for making this happen today. Yeah, and thank you all. And thank you, everybody, for watching. There will be a recording of this posted on YouTube in the coming weeks. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay.